Hello and welcome to episode 115 of the world's first Paul Weller fan podcast. I'm Dan Jennings, and 10 years ago, I gave up my live stream and career as a radio presenter with one big regret. Never getting to interview my hero, the legendary British musician, Paul Weller. This podcast exists purely to solve that issue. Welcome to Desperately Seeking Paul. In this episode, I'm joined by another absolute legend of the music industry. This fella has undoubtedly been one of the best TV and radio pluggers in the business, Nigel Spanner Sweeney. We're talking U2, Rolling Stones, Simply Red, The Cure, Depeche Mode, UB40, Robert Palmer, and so much more. We dig into some of the great stories of his career, including times starting out with the likes of Clive Banks and Gary Crowley, to plugging for The Jam, The Style Council, and a lovely connection for the comeback single Into Tomorrow with Paul Weller solo. We also chat about Live Aid and Do They Know It's Christmas with involvement from Paul and Spanner. Make yourself comfy for the next hour. This one is a proper epic adventure. Let's get into it. Nigel Sweeney, thanks for joining me. How are you doing? Good, good. I'm fine. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. So Spanner is what everybody calls you. I have to ask, where does the nickname come from? Well, it comes back to, a, maybe I'll tell it to you. I'll broadcast it. <laughs> okay. What happened is many, 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 many years ago, when I first started, I transferred from a publishing company called Rondo Music, who was the publishing company for A&M Records. So I met a lot of people there and I actually, dare I call it, had my part gliding path. No, not gliding, but my aircraft path going upwards from there because I was a junior. I earned 20 pounds a week, seven and a half shillings for sandwiches as well on luncheon vouchers. So this was back in 1776. Ah. Right. And then what happened is I just like music. And so there was a lot of music in Ronda. They did Bob Marley. I got to meet Bob Marley. The best story, because what happened, Nigel Burlinson, the um, company secretary, he was close to the Marley camp. And I can't remember, the, what's the guy's, the manager's name? He sort of come to me in a bit. But anyway, Bob Marley had called him up and wanted a watch, and it was a gold Rolex. So now, remember the year 76, I am the gopher, the go for this and go for that. And I was told by my boss, Nigel Burlinson, can you take this to Bob Marley at St. Peter's Square in Chiswick, but don't get the bus as you normally do. Get a taxi. So for me, this is like Rolls Royce time. <laughs> taxi. <laughs> I'm a star. Anyway, so I had this box and I knew it was a watch. I knew it was a Rolex, but I didn't really know about things like that. And I didn't know. It was obviously valuable. Anyway, I walked into St. Peter's Square into Ireland and I went up to the room where they said he was, and there were two big, beefy men outside, black Rastafarians. And I said, I've got a package for Mr. Marley. They cautiously opened the door. Well, I couldn't see anything in there because they were all smoking joints, <laughs> right? They were all giving it the, <laughs> the reefer. But I didn't know about things like this. I'm 17 years old. I didn't know about drugs. I was totally naive. I think this is the first time I've been to London when I started this job and the first time I'd have been in a taxi, to be honest with you. I could not see through the smoke. I didn't know who was in there, but it was obvious that there were lots of feet around because I went down on my hands and knees <laughs> to get below the smoke. Then eventually I said, I've got a package for Mr. Marley. He said, come here, man. Right. Anyway, so I gave it to him. Thank you, Mum. Right. He knew what it was, right? And that's it. I was out. Gone. <laughs> and then, so that started my interest in knowing what these people... I've always been a fan of what I call pop music, I suppose the way is. I mean, my older sister, she had things that like the monkeys and things like that. I just like pop music and I like music in general. I didn't know what I was going to do because I was actually a classical musician when I was eight. I won a scholarship to the Royal College of Music. And so I was a bit of a child prodigy, but intelligence wise, I wasn't right. I, I didn't do very well. So then there was an advert on Capital Radio. They used to have a thing in 74 when Capital Radio started. They had a thing called the Job Finder Line. And this was part of their brief to transmit in London to get their license. So one morning I was putting my shirt on for school and it was like, in London, there's a publishing music publishing company that need a junior. Music. So I rang them up and I was one of 99 people to go for that job. 
And just going back to £20, the offer was between £20 and £30 a week. And I nearly found it upright at the beginning because what I'd done is I'd done a man map, but still it comes down to man map. So I went into for this interview with Nigel Berlinson, the company secretary, and he said, we're offering between £20 and £30. He said, how much would you want? So I said, 30 And he nearly fell off his stool, his chair. And he said, oh, because I think the 98 people had gone for the 20 quid thinking they'll get the job easier because it's less money. And he said, well, can you tell me how you make that out? So I said, well, it's uh, £6 for the train fares. It's uh, £5 for my mum for lodging and £3.50 because I was a car nut and it cost £3.50 to fill my mini A50 up. And then there's £4 spending money and then there's sandwich money. He said, oh, well, we're giving luncheon vouchers, so you won't need that. But anyway, he said, but that's fine, £30. So I then got hoisted up to a guy called Bob Grace and he gave me the job. And I, again, to put my, not put myself down, but the wet, the starting wage was £1,260 a year, right? Which isn't a lot, but actually it was pretty good, right? In those days, I was young. I didn't need loads of money and things like that. So then I did that job for five years as a junior, just running packages, going upwards a little bit. I then became a sort of what they called a promo man. But I met a few people at Radio One. It sort of interested me. Then what happened is I worked, started working for a guy called Clive Banks, who we will talk about again. And I had an interview with him in a pizza place in Covent Garden. And he said, what's your favorite record at the moment? So I said, it's a record by the Motors called Airport. He said, oh, I do that. That's great. And he gave me the job. And I started working the now, then comes, I went into his office and he's got a lady there. His secretary was called, you could have secretaries in those days. It wasn't um, politically incorrect to call them a secretary. And Hilary Shaw was just lovely, was interested in making sure that that business survived. So she was the Clive secretary. Clive looked after what are called proper bands, right? Elvis Costello. And then there's going to be the next one I mentioned. You won't call him because we can come back to this one. Was Bob Geldof. What happened, there was also a kid there, scrawny, spotty, um, just a little kid, right, who was squeaky, all the thing, called Gary Crowley. <laughs> so me and Crowley, were we weren't thick as thieves, but what happened is very on. Crowley was the, a fan of this bloke called Paul Weller, right, and gave me a cassette. He did a special cassette for me of jam tracks, a lot of B-sides as well. It was just great. So he introduced me to Paul Weller. So then what happened was because Clive looked after what I call majorish artists, and Paul Weller was obviously one of those, and I think they took it over. Crowley would be able to tell you this exactly, but I think they took over at all mod cons time. So where does the spanner bit come from? <laughs> right, so let me get there. <laughs> so then what, then what happens is the first record I promoted – was going underground. And I mean, it was just phenomenal. I remember doing a Radio Luxembourg interview, premiering it, et cetera. And then all of a sudden, it, it goes straight into number one. Oh, by the way, I was on 5,000 at this point. <laughs> so it, it was a buzz. It really was. It was a very, probably that's what addicted me to it. This was a buzz. And then what happened is it would fall flat on its face the following week because the 200,000 kids, uh, jam fans, had gone out and bought it. And I went to go and see the jam with Crowley loads and loads and loads. And I just found it totally, again, addictive. It was just brilliant. But I'll get back to the Spanner story. You know, we did things like uh, I got a call from the very lovely Kenny Wheeler, who used to frighten me. But he said, Spanner, Paul wants to do Tiswas. <laughs> Can you get it sorted? Right. <laughs> so we did. And they went in the cage in Tiz was. No, I, I didn't know this. So what were the, cu the custard pies and all that? Splattered with the gunge. <laughs> right? Well, of course, Paul is and um, was early, early, early on. You know, I, I wear T-shirts and um, shorts, but Paul was fully like, he was very good, well-dressed, right? So anyway, we got in there and I said, Can it, they're going to get absolutely hammered with the gunge. So he said, I've gone out and I bought three decorators' outfits, you know, like nylon things, and they put those on so they wouldn't get too bad. <laughs> <laughs> and then afterwards, 
I then realized because the night before on the Friday night of the Saturday Pro, so this is this is Sally James and Chris Tarrant and Spot the Dog. Bob Carroll G's, yeah. Bob Carroll G's, you're absolutely right. So they played Birmingham, whatever it was the night before, probably Birmingham Odeon the night before the jam. So all of the jam fans knew two things. One, they were in town and they were at such and such hotel and they were at um, the, the the studios for Tiswas and they're live on the program. So they knew exactly where they were. I think it was called ATV, the studios at that point. What happened is we go for a drink afterwards in the bar on the whatever floor it was, the 12th floor, 7th floor, 12th floor, whatever it was, with Sally James and Chris Tarrant. Because it's a major thing. The Jam were huge at this point. Probably the most exciting band for that era. Anyway, then we suddenly realised that, and Kenny was more aware than and I was aware, is that all the mods had driven their scooters and surrounded the building. There was actually like a circle of Lambrettas. Shit. So suddenly there's a bit of a problem. Not my problem as much. It was Kenny's problem because he's obviously was his tour manager and the, the, the Jam's tour manager. And probably John was there as well. Like, this is serious. When you get like 3,000 people trying to get hold of somebody, they'll get them. So we got put in three taxis and put in the holding bay downstairs in the loading bay of ATV Studios and driven out. I've never been so frightened in my life because the power of several thousand people, kids, rocking these taxis, we were rocked. Anyway, we drove off and that was This it. sounds like Beatles-level hysteria, right? It sort of was. It sort of was, you know. So anyway, so I was, I was getting quite a reputation. I think I had quite a good reputation as a young plugger. And pluggers were important in my world because, I mean, several people will argue with that, you know, saying the A&R man's more famous or the uh, marketing man or the lady is more famous. But actually the pluggers, what we did is we got records played on the radio and the bands on TV. And it was a process, I have to say, that I realise now more it was a process, but... You had, in the case of the jam, you needed to get it out there, get it on the radio, get it on the TV, get the video on the TV, and you get it to number one. And then hopefully you hold it there. But unfortunately, the jam used to drop to like 29, 39 the next week. It was just the way it was. You know, 200,000 people buying up on the first day, which jam fans did. It then drops like a rock the following week. So the Spanner story, so this comes back to the Covent Garden office that Clive Banks had, Hillary Shaw's office. I've got Gary Crowley in the office next door, hanging around in there thinking he was, you know, elevated. <laughs> and um, I think there was a DJ called Crowley. It clearly doesn't absolutely agree with this more. It, it's more or less right. But Mike Reed was there as well. And then suddenly I walk in to the Hillary Shaw's office next to Clive's where Mike Reed and Gary are. And there's a girl there called Jody who I've met a couple of times and it was just a male, unfortunately, a male thing. But what happened is I'm mean, Jody. She said, hi. I said, Jody, your body's like a spanner to me. And she said, what? Now, she was a young girl. I was a young guy. She was a young girl. And I don't think she'd ever heard this line before. Your body's like a spanner to me. She said, what? I said, your body's like a spanner to me. She said, what do you mean? So I said, it tightens my nuts. <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> oh, can you? Well, anyway, then all of a sudden, I heard groaning. Now, remember, Mike Reed's hanging out with Crowley, probably because of the closeness to Paul Weller, because they were. They were close. And Mike Reed was a major thing with the jam. So anyway, from that moment, Mike Reed and Gary Crowley called me Spanner, <laughs> told other people. And of course, those other people, oh my good God, he didn't, did he? He did. Oh no, that is awful. Anyway, so then from then on, it became, they told this story. So I became Spanner and everybody, <laughs> everybody calls me Spanner. <laughs> 40 years because of a terrible child line. Well, here you go. And I'll tell you, actually, yes, probably. But actually, it made me pretty well known. Everybody calls me Spanner. I'll get on to other stories in a minute. But <laughs> I love that. That's brilliant. Clive was very well respected. So I felt in a great company. It was. And as I say, so then we had these four little scruff bags come with an album to Clive. And Clive gave it to me as the young whatever. And he said, what do you think of it? I said, I don't like it. And he said, well, they're trying to get us to do it. 
So I said, I just find it all a bit crashy and bashy and whatever. I just done U2, but the U2 boy album. So then what happened, and this is kind of involves me and Crowley. So I used to drive, I had a red Escort RS2000, which was pretty flash for a kid of my age and a plugger. And we drove to Egton House, which was the home, home of Radio 1. And Radio 1 were important in these days. They, they play a record, you could have a hit. So I drove up and jumped out the car. Crowley was left in there holding fort, or he was probably bringing a pile of records in to me in the, and blow me down. I got out of the car and there was a guy called Paul McGuinness was walking past, who was the manager. And Paul was a very, very decent person, very intelligent, very not successful. He couldn't get the band signed. So I said, Paul, and I grabbed him by the scruff of his shirt collar. I went to the car, opened the door, put the, the ignition key in, turned it on, and it came on with I Will Follow from the Boy, Boy album. And he went, you like it now? I said, I love it now. He said, I'll re ring you. And then he rang me the next day. And then I had a continuous 35-year career with you 2 And there were other things that, you know, uh, that happened afterwards. And it was a long-term relationship because I treated them as decent people. They treated me as decent people. And I think, I mean, I think it's fair to say they were pretty successful, right? Yeah. But, <laughs> but they were hard work because they were Christians and they used to have two static homes at a concert festival. One was for Bono, Edge and Larry, right? And they would sing Christian hymns before a concert. And then there was another one for for Adam, who was a little bit rock, more rock and roll and probably had his mates and his girlfriends in there. But this is not a story about you two. The reason I'm telling you this is because then there came... So I came out of the business, I got ill, and um, I went to Australia and I met a girl over there and I absolutely... So, so it's, 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 God, it's me. It's I'm the problem. I met somebody over there and I just fell in love with her. And so I phoned her up and I said, I'm going to come back again because I was going back. I said, is there anything that we can do over there? I said, we can go out, I can book it or whatever. She said, well, there's only one thing that I would love to go to. So I said, what is it? So I said, I'll, I'll try and sort it. So she said, oh, well, you two are playing. She said, but there are no tickets. So, oh, God, how am I going to do this? I mean, this is maybe 10 years after I'd retired from everything, from music. And I thought, oh, I'm going to... Now, Paul McGuinness at this point is incredibly successful because it's all been the Joshua Tree and it's been Rattle and Hum and it's been this, that, whatever. I and mean, so he wasn't Mr. Sort of, I'll pick the phone up to anybody. You have to get through like four or five people before you get to him. So I made this phone call and I spoke to the four or five people before. And then he picked the phone up. He said, Paul McGuinness. So I said, hello, Paul. It's Nigel Sweeney. So he said, yes, can I help you? <laughs> oh, God, this is going to go really badly. I'm going to be asking for like two tickets or four tickets. This is not what I wanted. You know, what can I do for you? You know, give me some respect. So I, I went on and he said, what, did, what name did you say you were? So I said, Nigel Sweeney. So he said, is this Spanner? So I said, yes, it is Spanner. He said, well, why didn't you call yourself by your real name? <laughs> That's how it went. Right? <laughs> So then I went from asking for two tickets. He said, you and a lot of other people want two tickets. He said, it's totally sold out. He then discovered I'm Spanner. He then offered me a 10-day trip in a hotel in Melbourne because, as he described it, the boys, well, they're all my age now, so they're not boys, but they were maybe in that dose, probably 30. So he said, the boys will really love to see you and will want to go out with you and have dinner with you and lunch with you. And you just tell me how many passes you want, not tickets, so that you can get in anywhere and you can get to the dressing rooms and whatever. And we'll do it. Do it. So it was a great nickname. Amazing. I'm so glad I asked that question. Now, you mentioned Clive Banks a second ago. Clive has come up on the podcast before because this is the guy who broke the jam into daytime Radio 1, the Eaton Rifles. We then get these smash hits, things like going underground, going straight into number one. They're in the US. They fly back to the top of the pops, all that stuff as well. Let's kick into some of these stories. So when we talk about the jam, presumably you were a massive fan, right? I absolutely. I mean, of course, at this moment, you still, I'm still, you know, I'm old now. But the thing is, is that at this point, you're dealing with somebody that is incre a band that's incredibly popular. So I treated them well to a point. Maybe they wouldn't agree with that, but, you know, it, it, it was a buzz being with them because they were incredibly famous in England. That was the big problem. It was just England. 
the single would go in, the albums would go in at number one, and then they fall flat the following week. We tried desperately to hold it, but then you're just playing marketing tricks and promotional tricks. It didn't work. They went in at number one and that was it. So just holding on the number one story is... So how many did they have? Three singles went to number one, I think, straight away. And there was one thing that I was very proud of that Paul was proud of is, let me just think. So Town Called Malice and was B-sided with Precious. That's right, yeah. And there was a very, very grumpy producer at Top of the Pops called Michael Hurl, who was also great at his job, but he was like, commandant sort of like you don't do that you know you do this anyway so he'd phone me up on the thursday the previous week and he said nigel you've got this double a side town called malice and uh, precious from the jam he said will it go in at number one i said it will so he said well what about them playing both sides on the program so we play town called malice And they perform that. And then we play out with Precious. What I was good at is good at saying yes when I knew that it would be right for the artist. So this was right for the artist, right for the jam, right for the record company to sell more records, and right for me as a promo man. It was uh, was in that yes. But I hadn't asked Paul at this point. So it was it was a slight danger because Paul might have gone, no, I ain't doing that. But he didn't. Because if I'm right, the only other people that had done it, um, and somebody on your site will probably put, pick me up, but the two people that had done it before uh, were the Beatles with Penny Lane, I think. And so Paul was quite proud of this fact. He knew that fact. So to get two on top of the pops on the same week was, for him, badge of honour. And that was a massive show then as well, wasn't it? Massive, massive, massive. You know, you literally could sell tens of thousands the day afterwards, which hoist you on the chart, hoist you up the chart the next week. We were on top of the pops a lot. And that's where I'm going to go back to myself and Crowley again. Is so the first time I looked, sort of looked after the jam. Um, and John, John Weller was a pretty scary man, but a lovely guy. Right. But he was looking after his son, you know, so he didn't want any nonsense or stress or anything like that. I'm sitting in the top of the pops, what I call the green room, uh, where the cafe was. Crowley was sitting on the stool next to me. He said, Spanner, that's Paul Weller over there, the one in the whatever suit. So I said, right. I said, I'll go and have a chat. No, 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 don't do that, Spanner. He won't like you. (laughs) Because he, I'm not what I call a mod, right? <laughs> or what Crowley would describe. Yeah, that, I always remember that. He won't like you. <laughs> but actually, we used to get on pretty well. We used to get on pretty well. We did lots of things where he probably would uh, you know, sort of mutter underneath his breath, sort of like spanners taking money out of my pockets because they're paying for the promo. And actually, they didn't. Polydor did. Then there was a classic case of politics. You know, it was like, who do you support? Well, I never said anything because the ideal thing for a promo man was never to be one side or the other. I, I was always just for the band or the artist. There were people that got serious, probably didn't break their, when I say break their records, didn't didn't promote their records very well because they supported the wrong football team. And if you supported the team that the producer didn't like, they wouldn't play the records. Bloody hell, really? <laughs> um, Gary Crowley also mentioned about you guys going into the studio to see the jam, creating sound effects. I think that would have been Air Studios. And would who, who would that, um, what's the name of the producer? Uh, would have been Vic Coppersmith Heaven. Yeah. So I didn't know him particularly, you know, so I was an o- oik as well as Crowley. But of course, Crowley was allowed in to go to those sessions because he was mates with Paul. So Paul would allow him. I was allowed because I was promo guy and friend of Crow- friend of Crow- I don't wish to say it like that, friend of Crowley. It sounds the wrong thing for me. We, we used to get on. <laughs> Right. But he'll kill me. <laughs> you know this. You, he'll kill me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He'll hear this. He, what if you be bloody shame to Dan? Don't worry. Nobody's going to get the impression that you're mates. I will clear that up in the edit. That's okay. <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll clear, I'll clean it up now. Listen, I've spoken to him probably for the last 40 years every day. We've been to Ireland together. We've slept in the same room together, not together, but, you know, in the same room on two single beds. Listen, he was a great, he is a great bloke because he loved music and his love for the jam was immense. 
We just used to hang out. So we did, you, you might remember a band called Department S. Is Vic there? We've lost Vaughan, unfortunately. But um, this was a record that Crowley sort of spearheaded because Vaughan was his mate and Vaughan wanted to be a pop star, rock star. And Clive put the record together, put the money out to record it. And we used our receptionist, Lila Sharin, to be on the phone during the record. It just all worked, you know. Crowley was an instigator because he was going out with a lady and she had this lady had a sister and the sister used to come up to our office um, because she had a mate and they all three of them used to come up to our office basically to eat a sandwich for some reason. <laughs> but we also had uh, the sex pistols up and around. Um, so Paul Cook said to these three girls, Karen, Sarah, and Siobhan. Excellent. I know where this is going. <laughs> Why don't you make a record? Right. So they came up with this song, which is a AR Mamwana. So Clive again put the money up for it. Crowley did an awful lot of PR on it, not radio and TV, but he was just around and he knew people to talk to. And we did that record and it got in the charts and it went up and we got them on top of the pops. And I remember we went to Top Shop. And I bought, the, or Crowley, one of us bought the outfits, probably like £7.99, the outfits, and the shoes, they had these shoes on uh, sandals. Anyway, I also used to look after the Fun Boy 3. And then Terry Hall saw them on top of the pops or saw them in a press thing, and he loved their shoes. And he went, I'd like to make a record with them. So then what happened is Fun Boy 3 featuring Banana Rama. It ain't what you do, it's the way that you do it. That was a massive hit because Fun Boy 3 were right on it as well. That was the start of a career. What else? So back to Weller. So Weller, Weller was doing this thing and it was fantastic. I just, it was unbelievable for a young guy to be looking after a band like The Jam. It was, it really was unbelievable. And Paul was so rock solid. But then what happened, of course, you get to the thing we, we used to look after a program, which was uh, The Tube on Channel 4. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, Jules Holland, Paula Yates, right? Correct. Clive got on well with Paula because of um, Geldof and looking after him. So that was all cool. We looked after very credible bands along the way. We did loads with The Tube, loads and loads and loads and loads. We also looked after The Who. Who Clive had had a long relationship with the Who, with the manager Bill Kerbishley and Pete Townsend, respected Clive, and Clive obviously respected Pete Townsend. And of course, there was that little bit of, I'm going to call it a little bit of a link between Townsend and Weller. So it was all quite credible to be involved with the Who and obviously the Jam, because both sides knew that there was a little bit of similarity between Townsend and Weller, if, if I'm right in saying that. But then you come to the bit where we go on the tube. The reason being is because we looked after the Who, but Daltrey and Townsend always fell out every so often. So we booked them on the tube. Was it the final pro final program or the first program? It was one of them. I think it was the okay. first. Right. So there was a lot of pressure on this because this is the first of a new program on Channel Four, and it was big. And Clive had a fantastic relationship with Malcolm Gary, the producer. And then all of a sudden, they have a biff up. Right. So Daltrey and Townsend are not speaking. So <laughs> this ain't going to be happening. So this is major. And I wouldn't have been able to do it. But Clive managed to squash it through and get rid of the booking of The Who. And he turned it into a jam booking. So because it was the first program, I got to look after it. So it used to be we used to have to get up there on a Thursday. And we stayed in a fabulous hotel called the, Go well, it was fabulous to me in those days, called the Gosforth Park Hotel. It was a five-star hotel. And we'd stay there. So because it was a new program, we went up there and we had to do it on the Wednesday. Again, you have to sort of fill in, you have to compromise a little bit sometimes. When it's a new program, it's never happened before. You have to practice a little bit, not the jam. They don't have to press it to practice. They have to check all the sound and the stuff, everything. So we went up there and on the Wednesday we're staying at what I considered very extremely flash hotel. So we were probably eating, I think this is on the Thursday night before the program. And there's a little, what do you call it, where there's a little band playing sort of lift music in the lounge where we were eating. It was like, Paul went, Bruce, should we get up? And then... Um, I don't think it was Bruce, actually. It was Rick and Paul went up there and they got on the drums and they got on the guitar and then Bruce did go up there. So the jam was sort of, what would you call it? Skiffing. 
<laughs> like lounge entertainment. Lounge entertainment. <laughs> amazing. And it was it was more than amazing because remember the jammer at the top of the tree at the moment going into number one. Now they're playing the bloody gospel park hotel lounge. <laughs> it was a blast. Uh, it was a blast. <laughs> um, so that that was that. Then we did the program. It went off. Incredibly well. It was extremely popular. And I mean, the jam were at the again, going back to being boring, the top of the tree. And it was exciting because they'd let in a load of fans, under 50. I don't know what the number was, but they'd allowed them in. Then what happened is I'd been asked by Malcolm Gary. I'd got close to fairly close to Malcolm Gary at this point, and because he he realized I was the or felt that I was the new young coming up of the pluggers, so I would be useful to him. So they they had to try and Fill in with us a little bit. Anyway, he said, there's a young bloke, he, he's writing a fanzine in Newcastle. So I said, right. He said, do you think you could get Paul to do an interview with him? I said, yeah, I'm sure he would. Absolutely. So this is all good. And that turned out to be a fanzine by Tony Fletcher, jamming. I think it was good. And Tony has been a, well, more than a fan of any, he's it's been a fan and he's a good bloke. So there's nice little things that come out of that. And of course, 1982, Paul Weller calls it a day with the jam, splits the band. Devastated, but you have to respect what he did because I think I could probably name another five bands that should have said no, stop now, because they reached that level of success. And clearly Paul was interested in doing other things. And obviously we've talked about this a lot on the podcast, that legacy is cemented, it's set in stone. They've not gone back and played around with it at all, really. Correct. But you stay on. You stay on to work with the Style Council, right? Yes. I don't know how it happened, but anyway, I just fell into the job, or Clive and I fell in, and Crowley fell into the job with the Style Council. We sort of lost Crowley at this point because I had had an argument um, with a guy called Tony Hale and uh, Radio One, and he, I pulled out something of uh, on U2 at the session with Kid Jensen, I think it was, and Tony was really unhappy. And I'd taken him up a special present of an acetate of brand new song by The Who or Pete Townsend, whatever it was, and he chucked it in my face oh. and it hit the brick wall and shattered, which what acetates used to do. And then what happened is to try and make amends. Clive and I, Clive mainly, we, he was very good friends with Ray Davis. And we took Tony Hale, who was the guy that I'd had the argument with because I pulled out a U2 thing off him. And we took along the scrunch bag, Gary Crowley as well. Right? We went to this play in the East End that was written by Ray Davis. And we took this Tony Hale and we sort of calmed that calmed the relationship back onto a good sort of stage. Then what happened the next day... And again, it's it sort of related with Paul because he was becoming more known. But then the next day, Tony Hale from Capital Radio, he then phoned and says, Spano, can I talk to Gary Crowley? Now, this is a bit odd. Why does this famous producer, and it, as he was, want to talk to the little scrunch Gary Crowley, right? And, you know, I'd prefer to be talking to him about my records. Why, why, why does he want Gary to talk about them? But anyway, what happened is Tony Hales had been given a bit of an ultimatum by a lady who Crowley will tell you about, Joe Sanderlands. And she's, Tony, where are all these new people, these new DJs that you're going to get me? And what happened is Tony had had, from the previous night, he thought, Crowley. So he pulled Crowley in for a test session that day, the next day, I think it was. And... Sort of went okay, but it definitely wasn't perfect because clearly wasn't going to be a perfect DJ. Is he'd never done it before, so he needed practice. So I, so I think he went in for the next three or four days to practice day after day after day. But this was totally allowed, and I thought it was great because I might be able to plug him. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so I was probably being selfish, but Crowley made a career out of it. You know, out of that moment, and it was out of. Somebody having an argument with me. Now, Crowley's not going to totally agree because he's going to say it's because of me and how great I am. But, you know, it, 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 there was something that happened in that moment that just worked. And it was great. You mentioned Kid Jensen, David Jensen, a second ago. And we'll talk more in a sec about the Style Council, what an amazing singles, album, you know, what a great pop band they were. But I'd love to touch on this as well because I read somewhere when you were – the audition when Steve White turned up to audition for the Style Council. Was it No Miss Studios, is that right? Gets the gig and is immediately thrown into the Kid Jensen session. This is a funny one. I can bring 
Right, okay. Um, and it comes back to Fletch, this story. So I'll give you a quick whiz. So I booked a Kid Jensen session. So this is something that it was pretty normal, right? A Kid Jensen session in Maida Vale Studios. Bands and artists were always pretty much up for it because it was good PR. All of a sudden, there's a little bit of a rumpus because they have to do a rehearsal because they haven't got a drummer because Rick's gone and Bruce has gone, you know, so he's got to get somebody else in. What happened is it was at Nomez and um, they got a drummer, you know, he's in. Kenny had sorted that drummer out. Anyway, so then this other little young chap turned up called Steve White. I, did, I don't think I knew his name at that point, but he came in and he did what, I'm going to say what I would have done, which is he pushed himself because Paul was in the background and Kenny was sort of saying, you know, well, we've got whatever his name is coming in, so that'll be, the session will be fine. And then this kid came in and he said to Paul, I heard him saying it. He said, listen, I've got my sticks. Can I just not play something to you? And Paul very well took that on board and fell for it. When I say fell for it, that's not being nasty to Steve, but fell for a young kid that's saying, can I just show you? And he did. And so he ended up doing the session the next day. <laughs> Which is mad, isn't it? Brilliant. Oh, I think it's brilliant. I'll quickly go around the story with this. So then I was I was invited by Fletch from Depeche Mode to go to a lunch, as he often did. You know, it was like him's wife, a lawyer, John Kennedy. And there was a lady sitting to the left of me called Saran Jones. Do you know of her? Well, the actress. Yeah. So she's sitting two seats away from me and... Um, I waited my moment and uh, the lady in between us moved away, right, to talk to other people. And I leant over to Saran. And as I say, she's an actress and quite a famous one at that and a very good one at that. And then what happened is I said, Saran, you don't know me. I said, but I have met you before. I said, 25 years ago. She said, what? So I said, well, I'm not saying you should remember me because of that. I said, because what happened is I said I was at Top of the Pops. And you asked to meet, um, or one of your family, because I thought I'd go for the safe option because I didn't know whether father or mother had passed away or anything. So I went for the one of your family wanted to meet Rod Stewart. So she said, yes. So I said, I, I organised that. She said, that was my dad. And then she said, that was the most amazing moment of his life. And he cried. And I'll never forget that. <laughs> so she ended up kissing me on the lips. <laughs> what it was is, her new husband was a guy, Lawrence Akers, who was well known in this sort of circle of friends and things like that, Fletch. And I don't know about Weller, but she's best friends with Steve White. They invited Lawrence to the wedding. That's where he met Saran Jones and they got married. It's a badge of honor as I introduced them. But because Steve White was now famous because he was in the Star Council. <laughs> and that's because I booked the Kid Jensen session. But that's bullshit in you, really. But <laughs> it was true. And he wasn't, listen, they were amazing, the Star Council. And we had so many hits. It was great. We had a great time. And it's interesting because at the time of recording, I've just got back from the exhibition in Brighton. So the exhibition of the Jam, the Star Council memorabilia. And there are these gold discs all over the place as well. And when you look at them, the amount of singles, we're talking hundreds of thousands of singles here, aren't we? The, you know, numbers of which unheard of today. Yeah, completely unheard of. So there's two stories I wanted to tell you, which is, it may be blowing smoke out my ass a little bit, but there were two stories that were important to me and I think important to Paul at the time. What had happened, because of his status, Paul Weller was pretty famous, but he'd had a major argument, I think it was in Belgium some years before, and the Boomtown Rats and the Jam fallen out badly, and it was all over a crate of beer. <laughs> One of the bands got like, let's call it 12 crates of beer. And the other band didn't get 12 crates of beer, but it was, so somebody, one of the bands, I'm not sure which way around it goes, but one of the bands nicked the beer. So of course the other band had the bloody hunt with them and they fell out. So what happens is so suddenly you get this thing called Band-Aid come up. I was, I won't say a major part, I'll say a large part of what happened in the early days because Gelder phoned me up. Hey, Spenner. Did you see that Michael Burke thing on? This is an impression of Geldof, by the way. I was going to ask. <laughs> did, did, did you see that thing, that Michael Burke report last night? So I said, I didn't. He said, get to watch it now. So I did. 
And then I phoned him back and he said, so we're making a record on Sunday. So get your people, get get Bono and get Paul Weller and blah, blah, blah. But of course, Paul Weller's fallen out with them. Then the, the, these these memories of this crate a bit go along. Right? <laughs> but Paul was, an, in my opinion, and also I would say Geldos as well, was an absolute diamond. So he walked in from wherever he was, very smart, with a cane and everything, turned up at Psalm Studios, which all these, ba- they were full of the all of these people that he, Paul, didn't like. And I'm pretty sure he's slagged off quite a few of them as well. Oh, and, and vice versa. You know, yeah. Duran Duran, Paul would have given them a hoisting, right? But they're all in the same place, in the same 20 by 30 room and drinking coffee. And then what happened is that gets recorded. Paul, on the previous day, had phoned Geldof up and said, I'll come and just in case you need some guitar. So he sat there all Saturday for like six, seven hours doing nothing, right, just to be there for Bob in case he needed him, which I thought was brilliant. And that day was something else. And I'm sorry, but again, being there, I think I was one of five people there that weren't singing on the record. And to see this, to see Geldof phone up Boy George and giving it a larrap him over the phone and saying, you're supposed to fucking be here. Now get on fucking Concord now. You've got time, right? And then see Phil Collins, you know, who I wasn't. I, I, I didn't really like Phil Collins, but to see him bash away on the drums, and I say bash, that's wrong, play the drums, it was incredible. It was mm-hmm. incredible. And to hear some of those singers doing their lines, and then that obviously, unbeknown at this point, that turned out to be Live Aid, and then that became a much bigger thing. And then Paul got hoisted onto the list. Not what I was saying. No, I, I felt it could have been higher up the bill, but he wasn't. I think they were second or third on the bill after status quo, which was the perfect starter, rocking all over the world. Yeah, you know, yeah. It was the bless them, status quo. Again, I'm not a fan, but they were what they were. But on the day, typical bloody plugger I was, I'd booked him on a TV program as well in Maidstone <laughs> singing some, Come to Milton Keynes, I think we did, or something like that, Star Council. Well, Paul really loved this, the fact that he was doing this and the TV programme. It was all good. And then we went back after the TV programme, we went back to the stadium, and he sang the final bits on the at the end. <laughs> you like to work them hard, don't you, eh? Yes, it's, it's right. But it kept them from being bored as well, because sitting around, you know, at whatever gig is always going to be a little bit boring, you know, if you're not doing anything. Well, this was keeping them fully working and it was great. We had a good time. We should talk Red Wedge as well, because this has come up a number of times on the podcast with Rhoda Dakar, Anna Joy David, Billy Bragg, for instance. And you were involved in that too, weren't you? Yeah, you know, and and I I think I've said to you already that I, I'm not the greatest politics person. You know, I don't really understand it. I don't get all jumpy whether I'm this party or that party. Paul would have a go at me. You, you bloody support Maggie, bloody Thatcher, you do, and all this something. Yeah, so we did the Red Wedge Day, right? And they played. I think Billy Bragg was on there. The Star Council did it. Now, still, you've got big echoes of the jam going on, and Paul Weller's in a place right, where they all know is going to be. So you get all the mods turning up again. And all I remember is being on the second, maybe the third floor of the building, wherever we were. And all of a sudden, we see this sort of white flag going outside. And it was like, so we opened the window carefully because we know that there's people looking up to us. But no, it was a kid on a radio mask. And it was swinging backwards and forwards, <laughs> white shirt on, trying to get near Paul Weller. Then what happened is they did whatever they did on the, I can't remember what song they did, but then we came out, Kenny got the bus that we were traveling on back to London, got the bus right up against the back door. And literally they threw us onto the coach with security either side. Because again, lots of people, you could get damaged by these people if they start ripping at you. Anyway, so we got on the coach and then all of a sudden I hear Kenny go, just drive through the fucking lights. (laughs) <laughs> because you look behind the coach, Dan, and there's 600 people following us running down the road in cars, on motorbikes, on cycles, on Lambrettas, the whole lot. I mean, we're talking the whole, let's call it Oxford Street. We're driving down Oxford Street and there is a tsunami of people coming along trying to get to the bus. And you know, if they got to the bus, they would have got to the doors. 
So we did that. Anyway, we did drive through the red lights. Then we got on the motorway and then we saw cars coming up beside us, trying to squeeze us and just get sight of it. It was, it was, it was, it was nuts. So if that's 86, we're into the cost of loving 87, Confessions of a Pop Group 88. And Paul's talks at that time of maybe in hindsight, perhaps him and Mick took their eye off the ball. Perhaps their focus wasn't what it should have been. And interest in the band, it's clear in terms of sales alone, clearly not where everybody wanted it to be, certainly record company. From your perspective as a plugger, did that job get harder at that point then? Yeah, you're probably right. It, you know, the, the immediacy, which we'd obviously had with the jam, it was still immediate when you came to the Style Council, but then maybe they came out, what was the third album? Was it Cost of Loving? Yeah, that's where it started mining. It wasn't as good. And I think Paul was having a bit of a battle with the record company because I think they told him this is not as good. And so he got the ump. And I think that's where things start getting a little bit all over the place. But then I'm going to just go forward a little bit. I can't remember when the Star Council and what we did when he broke that or stopped it. Basically, it was out of a deal, I think, at one point. And I had a terribly upsetting time actually at Nomad Studios because John Weller had an office there. And I remember going out there. I don't want to say too much, but I went, I went to see John, I think, about something else, but mainly about Paul. And he was literally stressed out to the high hill because his son hadn't got a record deal and he just said, kind of, what am I going to do? Right. And I really felt for him. But anyway, Paul then wrote a song. And again, it's not blind my own trumpet, but he wrote a song called Into Tomorrow. And I thought, this is fucking genius, this song. <laughs> right. And he didn't have a deal. I didn't know what to do, to be honest with you, but I thought of an idea. So there's me as the plugger. Then there's, oh, what's his name? The, the press guy, Philip. He's died, unfortunately. He was a press guy. Philip Hall, company called Hall and Nothing. And I knew he loved Weller, right? And there was a guy called Paul Dowling at Godis of Andy McDonald's label. So what I did is I did a, I did a thing about doing an independent single. I don't know how that quite worked out. I don't, oh, it was Paul Dowling. So I said to Paul Dowling, can you do? He said, of course I would be able to do that. So he said, but I can't do it without asking Andy McDonald's permission. So ask him then. So it was like, can I have a bit of, not time off, but can I do this? And Andy McDonald said, yes. So we put Into Tomorrow out as a single. I did the plug-in. We did this single and it got played and it got written about and it was a minor hit. I'm going to say a minor hit. It wasn't up to what I call top of the, the Star Council jam days, but it was still great. Oh man, yeah, I love that song. And it kind of announced that Paul Weller was back, didn't it? It was a great song. I think they probably still play it to these days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was on the last tour. That introduced, in my way of thinking, this is my man Matt's way of thinking about it. So Godis are a terribly important company in what I call the independent world. They didn't have the politics of what Paul had been used to for the last number of years um, at Polydor and things like that, because the big boss at Polydor had come to a bit of a halt with Paul because it wasn't working anymore. They considered the records weren't good enough. I'm not saying that's true, but it wasn't having the same success. So I think Polydor felt a little bit on the back foot and Paul was probably on the back foot. So he did this song into tomorrow. Then Andy McDonald hears a, and I'm not saying it's just because of that, but Paul Dowling, myself, Philip, I think Andy McDonald got into it. And then what does Paul do? Get signed? And what is it? Wildwood. Well, yeah, a trio of great albums. We've got Paul Weller, we've got Wildwood, we've got Stanley Road all on Go Discs. And I always wondered about that into tomorrow. I wondered the story because that one released as the Paul Weller, organically grown by the Paul Weller movement, and it's released on Freedom High Records. There's one other story that I'm going to come up with. So um, one day I got a call. He didn't call me regularly. He didn't want to. I'm sure he didn't want to, but we got on okay. Then what happened is I used to do a band called Hazy Fantasy. Do you know who they are? I've heard that rings a bell. Yeah, I've heard the name. I'm trying John to Wayne is Big Leggy. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And they were great to a point. You know, it was, it was, it was fresh. It was a bit mad. It was very quirky. They had a, oh, come on, Nigel, think of this name. They had a backing group and it was the girl that sang Soul to Soul. So, Oh, um, Karen Wheeler. Yeah. Okay, she was in a little group that they used. Yeah, aphrodisiac. Yes, that's it. <laughs> God, I know some useless information, right? No, it's not useless. <laughs> so aphrodisiac were great. Yeah, they worked with a jam right towards the end. So Beat Surrender and, and that EP. So I think they sang on like Move On Up and War and things like that on that on that final release. You're right. 
Karen Wheeler and Claudia Fontaine. And what had happened is Paul had phoned up and said, can you give me the number of those aphrodisiac girls? So I said, yeah. So it was like sorted. They were great singers. That was a funny moment. And again, it's not to do with anybody going, well, you should do this, do that. It was a little bit of luck. And Paul Dowling was a great marketeer and he was in that go disc company. And so he had the respect of Andy McDonald and Andy McDonald was the boss and that it just all dovetailed in. It just worked. And we should say you've, you've seen Paul in recent years, right? Yeah. So, so yes. And so what happened is, unfortunately, I've got, I've got MS, so I'm in a wheelchair 24-7 most of the time. So what Crowley and I organised is to go to the Paul Weller gig at Wembley, not stadium, Wembley Arena. And so he's pushing me along in a wheelchair, and then all of a sudden I get a, what do they call it, a post on Twitter or something like that. I've just seen Gary Crowley pushing a bloke in a wheelchair. They look like the Little Britain blokes, right? Because he was bald like me, of course, because <laughs> I'm in the wheelchair. And, and Crowley got the, it was just funny. It was just funny. Anyway, so we turned in. Now, I haven't seen Paul for a few years at this point. We're obviously both older at this point. And Kenny's still there sitting on the on the, on the chair, sort of commanding everything. And um, we walked in and he went, oh, fucking hell, Spanner's here. Uh, what did he say? Is something else a bit nasty? But it, it was funny. It sort of tells that he's got a sense of humour as well, because he has, right? And they just had a little dig at us. Oh, fucking hell, it's Spanner and Crowley, you know, <laughs> in a sort of downward way. What a lovely couple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, it, was, it was all that sort of thing. You're quicker than I. It's nice. You know, they've given us good seats and we went in there and it was great. And Paul is a genius at those sort of things. Now, before you go, we should talk about some of these other acts that you work with as a plugger. Um, we're talking things like, you mentioned you too, but The Cure, Simply Red, Depeche Mode. The Cure were hugely wonderful people. Uh, I did The Smiths um, at one point. But The Cure was somebody that really got to me because I think, like, Paul's me. It's something just resonated in me about that music. And I met Robert Smith very early on in, uh, he was already famous, but I met his manager's office and he went up to the girl on reception and said, uh, can, you, can you check this for me? I think they've charged me £8.50 twice on my access credit card. And I thought, <laughs> that's detailed, <laughs> right? And I quite liked it. I don't know why, I just quite liked it. You know, and I've had many, many a story with him because he had a go at me once, big time, and he said, you and Ita at the fiction office seem to have made a decision that we're coming out with this single when nobody's bloody asked me. And I went, I am so sorry. I can't say anything. You're right. People have to stand up for themselves, and I felt that he would. Right. And he did. And he was right. I don't think I really was that person. You know, Paul Weller never gave me his phone number because he didn't want me ringing up every five minutes. But I would get a message to him through John or through Dennis Monday or, or, or whatever. So you have a relationship with these people, but it's not a go out at dinner with them every night or things like that. But they like to know you're there. And the Simply Red thing was we had a massive period with them. You know, it was massive. It was very simple. They were in the trenches because the record company, a guy called Max Hull, I think he probably splurged about two and a half, three and a half million on them. And they were deemed that they were going to be very successful. And then what happened is they weren't. And I'd left, the, I'd left Clive Banks at this point to start Ferret and Spanner. And they had a single, which was Money's Too Tight to Mention, come out. It got to number 18, which if I'm honest with you, it's not bad, right? But it's not, it's not flying at number 18. And then it drops like a stone the week after. And then what happens, they bring out three more singles on top of that and none of them get anywhere. If you put three and a half million in, you'd be panicking as well. So they panicked. And then I got a call from Elliot Rashman. And this game, I'm sorry, I'm blowing me on trumpet, but I got a call from Elliot Rashman, who was the manager. I used to get on with him great. And his partner, Andy Dodd, they said, Spanner, we always liked you. Uh, it's a strange statement. We always like to, and that's why we're in. Um, <laughs> would you consider looking after us? We always wanted you to, but, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I said, well, I will, Elliot, but, you know, I said, I'll do it on one condition. Two things. One, I'm not air sea rescue. I can't guarantee anything. But I said, I'll bloody try bloody hard. And I said, but there's one condition. So he said, well, whatever. 
And so I said that you re-release Holding Back the Years. And he said, but it's already been out as a single and nobody wanted to play it. And I said, yeah, but I think I know the reason why. And he went, why? So I said, well, I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> tell you that. Yeah. So it came out and I was very lucky to, do you remember I told you about the guy, the Michael Hurl, the Top of the Pops producer? Yeah. I was at this point, I was good at saying yes or no to people. So they knew where I was. They had to trust me. So I got a call from Michael Hurl, the producer, and he was really strict, right? And he had a program called the Montreux TV Montreux TV Festival in Switzerland. I had had other things on there before, and he phoned up and he said, you know this band that you look after that you keep sending my son to, which I didn't, he asked for tickets. It wasn't me sort of plugging his son. That sounds a bit weird. I said, simply read. He went, that's them. So he said, couldn't they be in Montreux on stage at 11 o'clock in the morning? And remembering this is like 2.30 in the after- 3.30 in the afternoon, the previous day. And I went, yes. Okay, that's a booking. I love it. You're not checked with a band. You're not exposed to anybody. No, because the chance is unbelievable, right? The chance is right up there with the, one of the greatest. It's up there with a decent, really decent plug. So what happened is I found the manager, I found the MD, and that's to get a private plane, right? And we turned up and we were on stage in the And the one thing I can guarantee is that Mick Harknell, for all his ups and downs of personality, maybe, let's call it, and his red hair sort of fieriness and things like that. He can bloody sing like a bloody angel every single time. So I was always going to, as much as I can, get him to sing live. That's what impressed people. I remember seeing him on CFI Friday and he did, I'm sure it was just a cappella by the desk and it was just incredible. You get it, right, outstanding. It would have either been the tube, but it might have been Jonathan Ross, The Last Resort. And it was a song called Every Time I Say Goodbye. Every time I yeah, say yeah. goodbye. Well, anyway, this was fucking knockout. So going back to it, on stage is Hucknell, looking a little bit disheveled, I have to say, because he was, I think he was in that dreadlocky sort of thing. But I knew he was going to sing. So the DJ or the introducer at this Montreux TV festival was a guy called Mike Smith, who was the Radio One Breakfast Show producer. Now, what you have to tie up here is Mike Smith is important because he's on the Breakfast Show at Radio One, right? His girlfriend is Sarah Green, who's the presenter of Saturday Superstore. So I grab, a bit like the Paul McGuinness story, so I grab him by the collar. Come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. Now, I don't know whether I should have been doing that, but I did. And it was one of those things. So I grabbed him and I dragged him and I said, just listen to this. So Hartnell sang Holding Back the Years. And he went, wow, because it was impressive. And he said, when I get back, I'll make that record of the week. And then Sarah said, and I'll talk to Kathy Gilby and I'll get the video played next week. So like suddenly it's like, yes, yes. This is what being a plugger is. It's getting your moments, you know, and it doesn't just fall into your hands every single time. Uh, same with the Weller thing, you know, it was, you had to do things properly. Well, this was just that I could see heaven at this point. It was going upwards. So we got back, he made it record of the week. And then what happened is it just started selling. It went, I don't think it went to number one. I think it went to number two. I think it was Joe Dolce Vita or whatever it was. It was <laughs> shut up your face. Shut up your face. I think that might have been number one. <laughs> but at this point, then suddenly you're on a different level. You're, you're into, ooh, something's happening here. Now, remembering that one, the manager said nobody wanted to play it. They didn't, right? And... Now I've got Mike Smith on the Breakfast Show record of the week five times one week. Suddenly other producers and other DJs hear it and go, well, that's pretty good. So they start playing it as well. And then suddenly it gets more and then it goes onto the A-list at Radio 1 and it's like, that's it, we're off. I think for the following that year and the following year after that, we were the biggest selling record album in UK. And I think the following year after that as well, it was the biggest selling, but it beat Brothers in Arms. I mean, you know, we're up to like 3 million albums. So suddenly at 3 million debt was going down. So I know that's about being a plugger and being successful in that sort of that, that moment, but that's what you're always trying to do. And that's what you, you know, I, I had conversations with Weller that were great, you know, but I think he was a little sad at points where it wasn't going in other countries and other territories. Because if you're famous in England, which the jam were, they were definitely famous or well-known in other major places, probably New York and things like that, Los Angeles on certain radio stations, but they weren't overall famous everywhere. And at the point you get something famous everywhere, 
like a, a, a simply red. Yeah, that sort of artist. It's mm. really great because then all it's, the whole world is paying attention to you. Oh, Span, I have to say, this has been absolutely brilliant. I've loved spending time with you. Thank you so much for sharing all your stories. I have two final questions for you before you go. The first one. Do I like Crowley? <laughs> no, it's not, it's not Gary Crowley related. Uh, the, the first one, you're allowed one Paul Weller song for the rest of your life. It can be the jam, the style council or solo. What are you going to go with? Into Tomorrow. Yeah, it really resonates with me. There's lots of songs on his catalogue. I think he's a really good, he's not the greatest songwriter in the whole wide world, but he's bloody good, right? You know, songs that The Bitterest Pill, you know, that I'm sure they probably mean something to him much more than it does me, but they were great songs. What was the album with Pretty Green on it? Would have been Sound Effects, yeah, 1980. Listen, it was just a great, Sound Effects was, a, I think, a great record. I think there's been lots of others, but I think that Into Tomorrow is a pretty good song and Everything about it is, I find, very interesting, right? And it certainly was a different stage of his life because he was probably, I would call it, transposing from the jam into the Style Council and probably going out of the Style Council and getting into something else, which became Paul Weller himself. Yeah. So final question. Purpose of this podcast is not least to meet amazing people like yourself who've got these incredible stories from the Jam, the Style Council, Weller Solo, and so much more as well, and digging into their careers. But it's also to get the interview with Paul Weller that I never managed during my radio career. I was a radio presenter up until around 10 years ago. Where? I uh, would have been well, all over the place, actually. I was at 210 in Reading. I was at uh, Mercury in Crawley, Orchard in Somerset, BBC Bristol, BBC Somerset, all over the place. You needed to know that bloke called Spanner to get you. <laughs> that is very true. If I'd had that, I'd, this, would, this would probably have happened by now, right? Point is, purpose of the podcast is to get that interview with Paul Weller that I never managed during my radio career. If it happens, what should I ask him, Spanner? Is he still upset with me for hiding in the toilet after I'd won a game of poker with John Weller, uh, him <laughs> and Kenny Wheeler on a train? And I hid in the toilet until he got into the station because I'd won 200 quid. <laughs> Well, they wanted you to get back on the table so they could win it back off you, right? Correct. <laughs> you see, because they were they were addicted to it. Because what happened is the money went from Paul to John to John to Kenny, from Kenny to Paul. Suddenly there's this young whippersnapper spanner coming in there, putting money down that they want. And they were very good at the poker, but they used to play blind all the time. How can you put 50 quid on a blind? Oh, my good God. But anyway, so when I won a hand, I, I've got to go to the toilet and I stayed there until the train rolled into <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, they, he's a very talented bloke that, you know, that has to have huge respect for what he's done from the jam to the Star Council to Paul Weller. And all three have been bloody successful. Over those three bands or eras, he's been successful in every single one. Yeah, I was trying to think about this the other day, actually. I can't think of any other artist with three eras like that, um, apart from McCartney. And if you're including Wings as a solo thing, so you've got the Beatles, you've got Wings, you've got solo, three iterations, if you like. But I can't think of anybody else. No, you, you're probably right. It's McCartney that I'd forgotten about. Well, not forgotten, but his music doesn't particularly bother me, apart from the Beatles and actually some of the Wings stuff. But Paul creatively has been a bloody force to reckon with, you know, and there's a lot of other people that would be very jealous of that sort of success that he's had over those three bands or three eras. You know, he still calls Crowley and he accepts calls from Crowley. I mean, you know, he's, something's wrong in his head. <laughs> Spanner, this has been a joy. Thank you so much for your time, man. Okay. See you later. Bye, bye, bye. Well, there you go. My thanks once again to Spanner, another amazing guest with so many great stories. Do check out the show notes for this podcast on my website, paulwellerfanpodcast.com. Now, whilst you're there, you can show your support by heading to my store. We've got exclusive podcast merchandise, sweatshirts, bags, and mobile phone covers. And you can also buy a virtual coffee as well. On the roll call this week. Hello to Johnny O'Brien, says I'm loving your knowledge on the living legend that is Paul Weller and enjoy listening on my early morning walk. Beth Lawrence said every episode is a joy and a walk through the soundtrack of my life. Thank you, Dan. Cheers, Lauren. Russell says great interviews, wonderful insights into how Weller has moved through the musical landscape whilst inspiring not just his audience, he also genuinely seems to inspire and help to grow those musicians around him. Hear, hear, Russell. 
Thanks for your note. Mike Clemens, cheers to you. Richard Jones Nerzik, hi mate. Mary G says, such a good podcast series, great guests and memories. Thank you, Mary. Hi to Simon Castledge. Jim Gearing says, hi Dan, the podcast is a weekly highlight. I'm really looking forward to the episode with Paul Barry. Ah, more on that in a second. Martin Glover, hello to you. Steve Perry says, hi Dan, thanks for a much needed podcast. Fabulous stories digging deep into the life of Mr. Weller. I've really enjoyed hearing what all the guests on the show have contributed to the Paul Weller story. Looking forward to Paul and the band's return to Australia. Thank you very much. Cheers, Steve. Thank you for that. Hi to Vince Bicarino. Russ Cox. Hi to you. Says, keep them coming, Dan. You really do extract the best stories from your guests. Not that Billy needed much prompting. <laughs> Always a great listen. That is so true. One question. He was away, wasn't he? I mean, and Spanner wasn't much different, really, to be fair. Uh, Alex McLaughlin says, I couldn't choose a top 10 of episodes, but Billy Bragg is a strong contender. Brilliant stuff. Thank you, Alex. Hi to Peter Cook. Says, every one of your podcasts throws new light on Mr. Weller and increases my appreciation of the man and his music. The Billy Bragg interview was extra special. Well, thank you, Peter. Cheers for that. Martin Alaric says, thanks from Sweden for a great podcast. Hello to you. Michael Redford bought you a coffee. You've earned every sip, Dan. Passion and dedication, but backed with extensive and meticulous research. Love it. Well, cheers, Michael. Rich Morgan says, how about interviewing Brendan Lynch? Keep up the good work. I would love that. Brendan, you know where I am. Terry Vine, thank you to you as well. Cheers to all of you for your virtual coffees. Really do appreciate your support. If you want to get involved, just head to my website, Paul Weller Fan podcast.com and just go to the store. On the next episode of the podcast, a hugely successful songwriter who started his career with The Questions, a band that I know so many of you listening absolutely love. We talk supporting The Jam, The Style Council, signing to Paul Weller's Respond record label and so much more. Yes, Paul Barry on the next episode of the podcast. Make sure you follow and subscribe wherever you get yours. You can find me on Twitter at WellerFanPod or on Instagram and Facebook Paul Weller Fan Podcast. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time.